So last week we spoke about the seas of Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to speak about three things today concerning prayer. Because the text is found in uh, Matthew chapter 7, uh, verses 1 through 11. But we're not going to do all of that. We're just going to do the first couple of verses of Matthew chapter 7. And it talks about prayer. What does that mean? You know, why do we pray? How do we pray? And the title headings that I have is the purpose of prayer, the process of prayer, and the particulars of how we should pray. So um, those three subjects we're going to nail down, but not today. We're just going to nail down today the purpose of prayer and the process of prayer. So important. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7, and we'll read the first couple of verses. And the title is called The Purpose of Prayer, and a parallel scripture verse that's going to go with that is John chapter 17, verses 21 through 23. So Matthew chapter 7, beginning in the first verse, We spoke last week, do not judge lest you be judged, for in the way that you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you, and we clarified that he's not saying here, don't judge in terms of being a hypocrite. If you're a hypocrite, he says, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you can take the splinter out of your brother's eye. So he's not saying here, some may say, oh, you're judging me, you're judging me, because very clearly... Paul judged the man who was living with his father's new wife and said, uh, I judged him already, move him out. So they put him out of the, uh, the fellowship. So there is a righteous judgment that Jesus said, if you're going to judge, judge with a righteous judgment. And then <clears throat> he goes on in verse 7, and that's what we're going to speak about, prayer. The confidence of prayer that a person should have when he prays to the Father. But I want to elaborate a little bit more about not the confidence as much as the purpose of prayer. So he says this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. And if you know anything on the verbiage of it, it's in the... It's in the present, the present imperative, which means keep asking, keep knocking, keep seeking, not just once, once, once. But why are we asking, and how are we asking, and what's the, the purpose of asking? Is it just for me, you, just to do it because the Bible says to do it? Well, that, that could be a start, but th- there's a purpose for it. Didn't Jesus say, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. So the purpose of prayer is for his will to be done in my life. Now, in John chapter 17, verse 21, I'm going to tie this in. Jesus said this, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Listen up. That the world may believe that you sent me. Okay, so what's he talking about? Just agreeing with each other? No. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them. Is he talking about just till we get to heaven? No. That they may be one just as we are one. How was Jesus one? Jesus was one with the Father as a human. He was both God and man. But he was one on his dependence, one on the power of God in his life. That they may be one as we are one. I in them, Jesus, and you in me, the Father, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me And love them even as you have loved me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them. What is he talking about? The glory, the resurrection power of his glory. All that he is, 
he has given to us. So his prayer is not just unity in agreement, but unity with him and him with the Father so the world may know. So I believe that unity is not only being conformed into his image of his uh, holiness, but also into the image of his resurrection power. You can't separate it. That they may be one as we are one, you and me, they and us, that the world may know. So what is going on? Here's the process. That's the purpose. The purpose is that we would be conformed, whom he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. What does that mean? Like grow long hair and wear sandals? Is that the image? No. It's inside change. His spirit, more of him, is becoming more of me. Me is becoming less and more of his divine nature of who he is. Wow. That'll be completed in heaven. When we see him, we'll be like him. Perfect in our glorified bodies. With his glory, will be in us perfectly. But until that time comes, there's a process of us growing from glory to glory into his image. But how does that happen? I'll show you how that happens. First of all, 1 Corinthians 10.30 says, Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever I do, you stay at home for the glory of God. You work for the glory of God. You play sports for the glory of God. You, you, you're married for the glory of God. You're single for the glory of God. Whatever I do, my life is in Him. And I do for His glory. Now, that's obedience. That's understanding my purpose is to live for him. He tells me again in Colossians 3.17, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of our Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him, to God the Father. Why are we living on this this earth? To give him glory. To give him glory is that he's going to share his glory with me. Jesus was never a showboater. It was never about him. I've come to do the will of the Father. He was completely submitted and surrendered to who? To himself? No. To the Father. I and the Father are one. When you see him, the Father, you see me, Jesus said. And so when people see us, they should be seeing Jesus in power. Hallelujah. In holiness. Hallelujah. We're being conformed into his image. 2 Corinthians 3.18. The process. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Remember, the glory which you have given to me, I have given to them. We with an unveiled face are beholding in a mirror. That means we see it by faith, blurry. Mirrors aren't like they were today. They were brass. They weren't as clear. But we're seeing what I'm speaking about in a dark mirror right now. Some of you are hearing it and saying, I see it, but not real, real clear, but I, I'm hearing what you're saying. Well, that's a dark mirror, and that's okay. That's how it should be. So it says here, but we all with the unveiled face, meaning the Spirit of God, we've been set free, beholding as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord of being transformed. That word is metamorphosis. That's how caterpillars turn into butterflies. From the inside out, you're being changed into what? Here it goes. Transform into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord to the Spirit. We should be growing in the image of God from glory to glory. Not imitating it. There should be a change of you sensing the presence and the power of God, Jesus Christ, in your life, that they would be one as we are one. And until the day... When Christ comes back and takes us home and we get the full glorification, we should be looking forward to it. That's your purpose. And that comes by prayer. That comes by surrender, submitting, by putting to death the deeds of the flesh, by the Spirit. And so the process that's occurring in all of your lives, maybe you're saying, why am I going through this hard time? Could it be? The Lord is conforming you to his image to die to certain processes of your own life, the way it used to be, the way you always done things. Could it be your heart is saying, Lord, I want to be more like you, but I, I don't want it to happen that way. It's too painful. But that's how it happens. Can I get an amen? 
That's what you want. That's what I want. I want the power, his resurrection power. And we're going to have a scripture that backs that up. So I started with ask, seek, and knock. But you have to have a purpose. And there's a process to it. And next week we'll talk about the particulars of how that happens. We'll talk about prayer. How do people pray? What is prayer? Let's get some examples from the scripture, from the Bible. And that's going to be very interesting to see. But now we see that we're being transformed into his image, his spirit image, his character, his power, his purpose. Paul, in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. You see, Paul knew the Lord very well. He said, I need to know more and the power of his resurrection. Think about the apostles. You know, when the power of the Spirit came on him in the day of Pentecost, in, my, in his name he said, you'll cast out demons. In my name you'll lay hands on the sick. I mean, isn't that the power that I want? Isn't it the power that you want? Was that just for those 2,000 years ago? No. But we need to grow in understanding. First, we need to hear from the word and then understand the process and then look forward to the goal of him being glorified in me so that when people see me in the name of Jesus, be healed. Now, I'm not saying it's a carte blanche because next week we'll talk about what is his will. Your prayers will be answered according to his will. And there's a lot of stipulations here, but there's a lot of blessings, too, in understanding that you are becoming more like Jesus And less of you. Less of my self-will, right? Less less of, of me having my way. When Paul prayed that the thorn be removed, and here's some of the particulars of prayer, it's always a definite yes or no. It might be different or it might be delayed. We'll talk about that next week. In Paul's case... It was different. He prayed, Lord, remove this thorn, and God gave him a definite no. No, this has to stay. He said, because when you're weak, you're going to experience my power. And you've been seeing these wonderful things in heaven that no man has seen, or or these new uh, revelations, your pride is going to well up. So I'm keeping this thorn. What that was, we don't know. But... In my weakness, Paul was saying, in your weakness, my strength is demonstrated. So there's a process that occurs for us to experience God's power in our life, and that comes through weakness. But praise the Lord. That's okay. I want to experience all that God is. Can I get an amen if you're here with me? Can I get a real amen? Okay. Keep me stirred up. All right. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. Jesus becomes more manifested in us so that he becomes glorified in you and you in him and less of me. The glory you have given to me, I have given to them that they may be one as I am one with you. Let Jesus, his power, his character, be so evident in my life and your life that when you go and transition into heaven, it's not going to be, well, it's going to be a big change. You could bet your bottom dollar on that. But that process should be happening now. Not, well, wait till I get to heaven. If that's such a good thing to happen in heaven, why wouldn't I want it now? I want it now. Now, 2 Thessalonians, <clears throat> turn with me. Chapter 1, verse 9 and 12. And what was going on was they were suffering, these Christians. And Paul gave a a great teaching that those who are bringing that suffering, there's going to be judgment that's going to come upon them. In verse 9, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord And from the glory of his power. 
you and I are going to experience the glory of his power. Those who have rejected Christ and are not walking with Christ, they're not going to experience that. Yeah, they're going to go into the eternal fire, but it says it's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth because they're going to know I missed it. I missed it. All of this glory that Jesus is, this blessedness, this immortality of, of holiness, of cleanness, of, of unity, of heaven, I missed. And you'll be cast into outer darkness. Wow. You see, so it tells us here that those who are causing this struggle into these Christians because they're anti-Christ, anti-God, this is what's going to happen. He's not saying here, be vengeful. But he's saying, but this is the outcome. They will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Verse 10. When he comes, who's he talking about? When he comes to be glorified in his saints... On that day, and to be marveled, that means to be amazed, to be astonished at among all who have believed. When we see him, we will be like him. When he comes, you will be instantly transformed with his body and all of his attributes. He is sharing his glory in and of ourselves, you have no life. You have no glory. We are receptacles. We will receive all that he is. And that's the beauty and the love of God. He's saying, man, I'm going to share all that I am with you. You, you, who I created, who I died for. I want you. I mean, what, a, what kind of God is this? What kind of gift is this? What, what God would die for you and me? Who would leave the heavens and stuff himself into a human body, and then take upon himself all of our pain and all of our sin. He doesn't need us, but he wants us. I want to follow a God like that. And he said, not only that, not only are your sins forgiven, but I'm going to give you all of my glory now as you grow more and more, and in heaven it will be finalized. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who believe, I'm going to be looking at you guys. You'll be looking and say, Wow, is that you? Marveled. Look at the shine. Look at the glory. Look. And they're going to look at you. Are you kidding me? We're going to be marveled at those who believe. You're going to know each other. These, these bodies that are getting older, these bodies that struggle, you know, take two aspirins, you got a headache, you know, these bodies that feel pain, both mentally anguish or physical pain, or it, it's all going to change. Philippians 3, 20 and 21, your citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform, there's that word again, the body of our humble state into the conformity with the body of his glory. Man. By the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Paul said something similar to that in Romans 8:18. He said, I consider the sufferings of this present time, they're not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. (laughs) Are you waiting eagerly? Are you looking anxiously for Jesus? He wants you to experience him now. Are you waiting? Anxious? Lord, I want to be transformed more than just coming on Sunday. I want to have more than just having the information. I want transformation. Can I get an amen? That's the living God. Anything else is religion. I want the power, less of me, more of him, unity with his will. 
unity with his power, unity with his holiness. You know, the Bible, and this is not, this is not off, this is not weird. Peter says, you have his divine nature. It's not like I'm pulling this out of a hat. You have his divine nature. They both are in there, your human nature and your divine nature. It's which one you yield to, you become. You got your flesh nature, and you yield to that, well, you're going to get kicked to the curb. You yield to the Holy Spirit and the divine nature, you become more like him. And that, you know, when you become more like him, it's not like he's a part. You sense that. You sense the oneness. You sense the beauty of him. And it comes by putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Worship, brothers and sisters. Worship is a part of surrendering. It really is. I've said it many times. I want to meet. When I, seen, when I first came to the Lord and I seen this song leader. His name was Brother Al. Not this Al over here. But it was another Al. And he was an Italian. And man, he would say, turn to your hymnals. To da, 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 da. And he had such a joy. And it wasn't fake. And I said to myself, man, I want that. And then I would see others really in love with the Lord, lifting their hands. Now, I came from Catholicism. And, you know, you don't do that. Shh. No joy. Just quietness. I get that. Respect. I get that. Reverence. But as we read yesterday, I've come to give life and give it more abundantly. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So I would see these people enjoying God and, uh, man, I want that. Now, hear me out. I would mimic, and I don't want you to mimic. Well, I'm going to do what he does because I don't want to feel embarrassed. No, 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 no. But in my heart, I say, Lord, I want that. I'm not going to fake it. I'm not going to imitate it. But I want that. Give it to me. And he did. And you know how it begins? By me just as I sang that song when we first came. Oh, Lord, you're beautiful. You know. Or, you know, you are more precious than silver. I allow that little voice of tenderness be spoken to him. You're going to have distractions. People coming in late or people sitting down or whatever it may be. You're going to have that. But you got to focus on the Lord and say, Lord, this is you and me, the tenderness. And then before you know it, you're allowing yourself, you're giving yourself permission to worship God. Lord, I, I, I want to lift my hands. And you, okay, so I do it like a crocodile, just a little bit. But that's okay. Well, you might not want to do that. But your heart is there, and you're, you're making love to the Lord. I encourage you, church people. Worship is so beautiful. When you become conformed into his image, don't you think Jesus was real? When he said, oh, Jesus, he said, you hid these things from the babes. And it said, the Holy Spirit joy came upon him. When they said to him, Lord, even the devils come out in your name. And he said, don't be glad about that. Be glad your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And, he, and then he said that his joy of the Holy Spirit came upon him. He said, oh, thank you, Father, because you have hid this from the wise and the intelligent. You gave it to babes. Was that real? Yes. Do you want that? I surely do. That's the Spirit. That's joy in the Holy Spirit. Process through prayer. By you just saying, Lord, I want that, guess what? You're saying a prayer. You're asking. Now, continuing on to the second verse of uh, first, Second Thessalonians. It's a short service today. Verse 11. He says this. And this is something you want to underline. Two factors. One or three. Pray. Paul was saying to them, to this end also we pray. For you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling. Number one, worthy of your calling. 
Now, no one is worthy to be saved. He's not speaking about the calling of salvation. He's talking about your calling as who you are in Christ. You all got a testimony. We all got a testimony. I want to be worthy of being called a Christian. I want to be worthy when I follow Jesus that people will see Jesus. I want to be worthy. Ephesians 4.1. Therefore, I, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. 1 Thessalonians 2.12 again. So that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Worthy. Didn't I say that last week? He said, if you love mother, father, brother, sisters more than me, you're not worthy of me. Wow. So you see, his standard is high. He, he wants exclusive hearts. He, he doesn't want, well, here's, here's a little piece of it today. Here's a little piece of it tomorrow. He, well, it's growth. I get that. But it's like you get married. Do you want to share your husband and wife with someone else? Unless you're a Mormon. No. That person, for better or for worse, is yours. That's how it's supposed to be. Now, sure, I I understand there are things that occur in marriages, and sometimes there has to be that separation. I understand all of that. But I want you to understand, too, that God wants you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling as a Christian, as a son, as a daughter of God. So, if I'm talking like a sailor, I don't know why they say sailors, but if you're cursing a lot, is that worthy of Jesus? No. If I'm, if I'm, you know, hanging around the guys and the guys are looking at the ladies, hey, check her out, and all of a sudden, ooh, yeah, is that worthy of saying I'm a Christian? No. Well, you could make the example, whatever it may be. Yeah, you know, why? Well, I, I got to go down to, you know, New Jersey and gamble and, and make all this money. Well, does Jesus want you to gamble or make money? I don't think so. So we want to live in character worthy of the calling that he's given us. But here's the second part, and I love this part. Worthy of your calling and to fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith does he end there? the work of faith with power I believe the church has a lot of faith but there's no power so he was praying that there would be all goodness God will hear your prayer for all goodness, to fulfill the calling that he has on you as an individual with the work of faith, with power. That's what I lack. I want the power when I pray. I hear from God. I want the power when I say, Lord, I don't want to go into temptation. He says, you got the power. You could have faith. Well, I believe in Christ. I believe in one Lord, one spirit. I believe. And you have faith, faith, faith. But where's the power? Can I get an amen? Do you want power? Say yes if you're with me. I want power. The resurrection power of Jesus Christ. I'm sharing in him now, and I want more of that. But there's a process. But I'm giving you a a, a goal. I'm giving you a standard of, of height here. I don't want you just to shoot for coming here on Sunday and just saying I'm a Christian and I just got to hold on till I, get, till I get to heaven. No, there's more to it. I'm giving you what his word says as a goal to shoot for, and that is to have faith with power. And that comes through prayer. He prayed that prayer. Now, in verse 12, and we're going to add another scripture to that, and then we're going to end. He said, So, if you have faith and power, and you're walking in a worthiness of him, and and your desire is all for goodness, Lord, I want to see more people saved. I I, I want to be good. I want to, every good and perfect gift comes from from the Father of lights. I, I want to do good things to people. And so when that's happening, and you pray, Lord, give me the desire, you guys, well, what is your desire? Is it to spend it on yourself? No, it's... Pray this way. 
Our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I want your will to be done, Lord. And what is your will? That whatever you do in word or deed, he is glorified. You play. You sing. You talk. You fellowship. It's for his glory. I live for his glory. And when I'm living for his glory, there's sacrifice involved. But the power of him comes upon us. When you're living for his glory, you've got to have that purpose. So it says so that, here's the reason, so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him. Father, that they would be one. I in you, they in me, and us. i read it again. So that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him. Do you see that? You're becoming more. There's no, there's no separation. Less of me, more of him. Let him be glorified in me. And me in him. I'm experiencing. Hallelujah. I, I'm, I'm just saying, Lord, this is your will. And why not? Why not have more? Of him. Not more information about him, but more transformation of his character, of holiness, his power, his wisdom, the way he speaks. Show me a coin. Give to Caesar what Caesar's. Give to God what's God. I mean, what kind of wisdom is that? That's wisdom from heaven. Lord, let, let me grow in that truth. Let me grow with the power of the Holy Spirit so that I speak in boldness. For when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they spoke. Oh, I'm not sure, but maybe if you accept Jesus. No, they spoke with the power of being united with the Holy Spirit. That's what I want. Be glorified in me and you in me according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Two more scripture verses that back this up. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. Again, prayer. For this reason, also Paul is writing this out of prison. Since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, why? To please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened, underline this, with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience joyously. He's changing us, conforming us. The prayer that you would experience all of him, of who he is, increasing in the knowledge for every good work, bearing fruit, pleasing God in all aspects. And we close with this. Ephesians 1.18 says the same thing. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? His riches. Hallelujah. All that he is. Come on, church. When we're rich in Christ, you're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. You're you're walking in the awareness of his presence. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, we're at different levels of maturity. But why? God's purpose for me and you is the same. To be conformed into his image. To be set free from from yourself. To be set free from sins. To be set free. Whom the Son set free is free indeed. I mean, if that's not real, I sure want it to be real. Amen? So it says here that he would... uh, would, He prayed that your eyes would be open to see his inheritance in his saints... And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward you who believe? There, these are in accordance with the working 
of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. So that truth for us is possible because Jesus was raised from the dead. If he was never raised from the dead, then the power of death was victorious over him. But because he was raised from the dead, that power that raised him from the dead, we sing that song, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. You know that one, right? Come on, church, give me something. Give me something. Amen. I don't know if you're memorized out there. or, But <clears throat> that power is by surrendering. That power is by believing. Faith without power I don't know. You're surviving. I want faith with the power of God. So he continues on here and we close. Which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come throughout eternity, And he put all things in subjection under Jesus' feet and gave him as the head over all things to the church. Are you the church? Are you his body? Is a body disconnected from the head? So he gave all authority to Jesus who is the head and you are part of his body. Can I get an amen? So that means his power is in you because it's him that you're connected to and not yourself put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all things. Let me just summarize. It's about prayer, but it's about the purpose of prayer. We spoke about the process, dying to self, becoming weak so he can become strong. Praying is part of it, for sure. Next week, we'll talk about the particulars of how do you pray from the scriptures. Pray this way. But for today, we pray, Father, thy will be done. We pray, Jesus, your prayer wasn't just a a prayer of unity among churches. Well, what is that? No, it's a unity with Christ and all that he is and all that he is in his Father that these may be one in us, his character, his purpose, his power, the Father's presence, the presence of Jesus. That's the oneness that he's speaking about. So we're giving conformed to his image. And there's a process. We read 2 Corinthians 3.18, beholding it in the mirror. We don't see it really clear. But we're following his scripture, his word, the goal that he's given us. We're being conformed or transformed into the same image from glory to glory until that final glorification comes. And now we yield and we live for his glory. Whatever you do, word or deed, do for his glory until that final day comes. And he'll share all that he is. But right now, there's the process called sanctification. Big word being conformed, transformed into his image. Not just the holiness, but the power in prayer. And that's what I'm focusing on. You have not because you ask not. See, prayer? Well, I can handle it. I don't need this. God wants us to learn how to pray. And when he said, ask, seek, and knock, It's that present imperative. It's a commandment. It's not just a suggestion. But to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on... And isn't that what maybe Christians lack in? Can I get an amen to that? Amen? Isn't that? I mean, prayer? Truthfully? Yeah. Hey, we're going to have a concert next week. Sign up over there. Hey, we're having a prayer meeting tomorrow. Sign up over there. Right? Right? Proof is in the pudding. Concerts? Yeah, I'll be there. Prayer? Well, I don't know, Pastor. 
Well, I'll tell you this, and this is very important. If you want more of his Holy Spirit, and if you want more of his power in his life, learn to discipline yourself to depend on him in prayer. Well, I'll pray at home. Ah, please. I wasn't born yesterday. You should. And I'll tell you a secret here. Pray for me because I am going to be tested. And I, like Paul says, pray for me. Pray for yourself. But we're in a place in this time of God's economy where we have to and want to become more like him in power and in prayer. We just cannot, and it's not that season anymore before the corona, before this craziness out there out in the streets, before all of this evil is coming up. It's no longer the same, brothers and sisters. It's not. So what do we do? Well, God has made a provision. He said, okay, now, now it's time. Well, how many people, and I'm going to close with this, and I'm going to ask everyone who wants prayer, you know, to come out of their seats and come to the altar. And I'm, I'm not no supernatural person who prays, you know, past the shadow of Peter and people got healed, none of that. But I'm learning. I'm learning to practice what I'm preaching because it's real to me right now, more than ever before, that God is calling me and he's calling this church to pray. I don't know what the future holds. I know he holds the future. But I do know that we have to learn how to exercise faith and have power in our faith and in our prayer. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Spirit, whatever you want to call it. But we need more. We need more. We need more. Since the coronavirus, you know how many people, you look at the statistics, Divorce is on the rise. Spouse abuse. Alcoholism. It's all on the rise. Why? It shouldn't be with the Christian if he's got an anchor in the Lord. But if his anchor wasn't strong, this is, that was the test that many have drifted away. And even in church, it's a test. If a person was really not anchored in it's going to be hard to restart because they become comfortable or maybe even got caught into a sin or a weakness, whatever it may be. <clears throat> and my prayer is, Lord, set them free again. I don't want to give the devil room in my brothers or sisters' lives. I don't want to say, okay, you know, knock them off. Keep, you know, that's the end of them. But I, I want to, and I want you to be with me too, I want to join in prayer as Aaron and her lifted up Moses' arms when the Amalekites were picking off those who were in the back, those who were weaker, those who were not following in the front or in the middle. They were in the back lagging, and the Amalekites were picking them off. Moses went up on top of the mountain, and he, when he lifted his hands up, Joshua, who was fighting for them, was winning. But when Moses put his arms down, it said that the battle went against Joshua for the Amalekites. And so there is a picture of prayer. So Aaron and her came up, and they both had Moses sit on a rock, and each one held up his arm. And as long as his arms stayed up, the battle went in favor of Joshua. That's a, pair, that's a, that's a picture of prayer. So tomorrow, we start off prayer meeting again. Tomorrow... No longer on the phone. Thursday, yes. But, for, but now on Mondays, again, we want to, that's a staple in this church. It's always been prayer. Now, consider, consider what you want to do in their prayer time. We're going to pray for an hour. I don't want to say to you, hey, we're going to pray for three hours. No. I want to make it as easy, but not as comfortable as well as a phone you come in faith because you want God and prayer is the access to get a hold of God can I get an amen can I get a louder amen Amen. thank you thank you thank you thank you father we are grateful 
Jesus, you prayed that prayer. (laughs) Not only for them, but for those who would come through his word, through the word of the apostles, which is us. Sanctify them in thy word. Thy word is truth. Lord, may we become what you want us to be. Less of John and more of you. The power of faith. Faith and power. Yes. Hallelujah. Lord, fill us all in this, in this body. That we would be all that you have blessed us to be. That we would take out all stops and believe your word when it says that. And, and strive. As Paul said, I press on to the high calling that we would press in, press on. And prayer is the beginning of understanding the power we have in power of prayer in Jesus' name. And Lord, if there's anyone here who's never made it right with you and you give the opportunity, your desire is that none should perish, but all would come to repentance. And repentance is saying, hey, I'm a sinner. And I don't want to do it no more. And I need you to forgive me, Jesus. And if that's you, just say, yeah, that's me. I want forgiveness. Raise your hand right now and just say, hey, man, God bless you back there. I need forgiveness. God bless you on my left. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. John 5:24. He who hears my word and believes him who sent me. The Father so loved the world that he sent Jesus. That's how much he loves you. It's a gift. He'll never force. He'll never twist your arm. It's your choice. And my prayer is that you would pray this prayer with me if you raised your hand. Father, I do believe in Jesus. Pray it out loud. Father, I do believe in Jesus. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, Jesus. I accept, I receive that gift of pardon, grace, not works, faith, not my feelings. I accept it. Now fill me with your Holy Spirit to live for you in my singleness, in my marriage, on my job, wherever I am. I want to live for you and glorify you. May I not be that selfish person I want to live for you in your glory. Empower me to do that. And I know you will. In Jesus' name, amen.